man is not free until he is released. But from what I know, freedom is an amazing word that gives me relief. The closer a man gets to freedom, the more anxious a man gets. Freedom is a powerful word. Freedom is love. Freedom flies freely like a baby bird new to the world. I can't taste freedom yet, but I know it's somewhere there. I'm waiting to be here. I've done everything I need. Now I wait to be free. The District of Columbia is really a very divided city, and you have the Anacostia River that runs through it. So east of the Anacostia River, Ward 7 and 8, is some of the most impoverished, challenged areas of the city. It has the lowest high school graduation rates. It has the highest unemployment in the city. If you look west of the Anacostia River, there are still pockets of poverty. There's pockets of more dangerous communities. I was seven years old. The first time I saw somebody get shot right in front of my face. That was kind of like the neighborhood that I lived in. It was kind of rough growing up. Just being outside of Clifton Terrace, we seen drug dealers, people getting shot, people getting beat up, prostitutes, crackheads, big roaches, big rats on the playground. There are two factors that are associated with increased risk of juvenile crime in a community and increased risk for recidivism when youth are returning to that community. One is extreme levels of poverty and the other is violence in that community. The district is a, is a horrifically segregated place and there are thousands of kids who grow up in very poor neighborhoods and attend fully segregated schools, many of which don't function well and don't adequately prepare young kids to get a fair chance at pursuing their American dream. Within that population there's a subset of young men and women who made mistakes and they tend to move from a system that's already failing them to one that's really, really failing them and sort of pu pushing them towards long-term incarceration. August 2000, Mayor Anthony Williams launches the Blue Ribbon Commission on Youth Safety and Juvenile Justice Reform. Comprised of judges, prosecutors, defenders, and community members, the commission is charged with examining the current state of juvenile justice in the district and to make recommendations for reform. Of particular concern is the state of Oak Hill Youth Center, the district's primary detention center for youth in conflict with the law. Elementary school, I was a bad child, whatever, uh, fights, uh, getting in trouble a lot. Mike's entry into the juvenile justice system was the story of a very typical youth. He had been uh, suspended for multiple issues at schools and then expelled and then there was a smaller crime that built onto another crime that built into a bigger crime. But what is so typical about his case was that he was really pushed out of the educational system. My grandfather had that, and then two weeks later my cousin had that. So I kind of like stopped caring about life then. I hang with the wrong crowd, led to wrong things. And that's what got me locked up and got me sent out okay. For many young men, going to Oak Hill Youth Center was a rite of passage. All of their older siblings, their older brothers had been through there, their fathers had been there, generations of families had been through Oak Hill. Built in 1967, Oak Hill Youth Center, located in Laurel, Maryland, was used to house the district's pre-trial and committed youth. Youth committed to Oak Hill in 2004 stayed an average of 79 days. It was dead time in their lives. It was a time when we pulled them out of their family environments. We pulled them out of their educational systems. We pulled them out of the city entirely. And when they went into Oak Hill, they really gained nothing. The place was a revolving door for kids, so kids would come in and out and in and out and in and out. It wasn't rehabilitating anyone, and reoffending rates were very, very high. Judge Eugene Hamilton presided as chief judge of D.C. Superior Court from 1993 to 2000 and chaired Mayor Williams' Blue Ribbon Commission on Youth Safety and Juvenile Justice from 2000 to 2001. In most instances, children who went to Oak Hill came out uh, worse than they were when they went in. If you walked into Oak Hill, everything was dirty, everything was dark. There was a sort of smell about the place because it was never clean and could almost not be cleaned. Dirty means like, <sighs> Like being in the hood for real. You had roaches, you seen crickets in the unit, you seen rats running across your feet. When I was a teen in uh, 96, I was then sent to Oak Hill, um, the all girl facility that's here, was here at Oak Hill Grounds. And I was there for a year. There was a 24 hour holding room at Oak Hill. 
when I was there. And it was supposed to only be for 24 hours, but it was so dirty. I ended up asking one of the staff, do you have some bleach? And I cleaned the 24 hour room so well that they kept me there for at least three months. The school of the old Oak Hill was run down, 30 years old. The windows were yellow and broken. Walls were creaky, air conditioning worked sometimes, heat worked irregularly. Less than 50% of the kids came to school at any given time. When they were going to school, there was little engagement from the teachers. There was a very low academic level that they were taught. Their expectations were not very high. Kids were not rewarded for, for academic success. The youth were, uh, were rad. Oak Hill was kind of like a dangerous place to be. At the time the Blue Ribbon Commission was launched, D.C.'s Juvenile Justice Agency and the conditions at Oak Hill had been the center of a 14-year class action lawsuit against the District of Columbia. Alan Pemberton is one of the lead attorneys on the case, now known simply as the Jerry M. case. There were kids who didn't really belong in an incarcerated setting at all. In fact, that was probably most of them. Uh, kids who didn't need to be incarcerated were getting thrown into uh, a prison-like setting. Kids who were awaiting trial, uh, who should be in a separate facility, were in with kids who had already been adjudicated delinquent. As a funny thing about uh, any confinement facility, if it has 60 beds, there'll be 60 people. If it has 70 beds, there'll be 70 people. If it has 100 beds, there'll be 100 people. If it has 200 beds, there'll be 200 people. Conditions of confinement were horrific. Children were treated brutally by guards and staff. There were reports of uh, kids using drugs. Sometimes parents would bring kids drugs easily, and sometimes staff would bring kids drugs. There had been some very uh, terrible uh, kinds of uh, instances of sexual abuse, both staff on uh, kids and then uh, kids on kids because the housing units were Un essentially unsecured at night, uh, very poorly supervised. There were a lot of illegal activities going on there. Staff lock kids in their cells for long periods of time. Kids routinely urinated in their cells because they were not allowed out. And the problem with Oak Hill was that the approach of the staff was very uh, correctional. Uh, the, the staff wore correctional uniforms. They saw their role as locking kids down in their rooms. They didn't see their role as working intensively with young people to help them solve problems and become successful adults. I mean, you had a system that was basically preparing people to be predators and uh, adult felons. I mean, it was a, a school that basically told people how to be worse criminals than when they entered. You put a child in a cruel environment and you treat a child like a dog and in a very short period of time he'll come out uh, as a dog in a, in a pit bull. Youth are different from adults. They're growing and developing in a variety of ways. They're amenable to treatment and amenable to change in ways that we think adults are less likely to be. There are people who just think that young uh, people who have committed crimes are felons who should be locked away just like adult felons. And, and so that's an obstacle that's been a kind of constant, uh, a constant problem to deal with. We know from prior research that using a simple punishment or deterrence model is the least effective way to reduce rec recidivism. If we're thinking about accountability for why kids commit crime and reducing recidivism, then we would look to characteristics of the youth, of their parents, of their families, of the neighborhood and the community to take some collective responsibility and collective action. One important example of collective action is found in community-based programs such as Mentoring Today, co-founded by Penelope Spain. We begin our services while the youth are still locked up and the idea is that we form a relationship with them for three or four months on a weekly basis so that we really get to know them before they face the challenges of re-entry into the District of Columbia. I met Mr. Penelope we were mentoring the day and it was kind of like I wasn't ready to change but they was willing to change with me. I kind of took like their hand and just went with the flow and ever since then like, I just stuck with the program, stuck with them, uh, asking for anything, asking for, like, any advice, help, um, anything they can help me with. I'm always, you know what I'm saying, I always call them, it's been like you first. What he has done 
is recognized his own personal history, his own uh, involvement with the juvenile justice system, and he's turned that into a positive. If I didn't get involved in Men's Home Today, I'd have probably still been doing the same thing as far as getting locked back up, um, smoking weed, keep smoking weed, um, hang with the wrong crowd. We had to get rid of Oak Hill. Uh, that thing was turning out uh, uh, juvenile delinquents rather than uh, rehabilitating juvenile delinquents. The other recommendation was, was that as each child came into the system, uh, that child was given a, a thorough uh, examination, uh, educationally, uh, emotionally, psychologically, physically, and otherwise. We realized that children uh, needed a continuum of treatment, not only in an institution in some instances, but back in the community. And when the D.C. Council didn't do anything with the recommendations, these residents organized. Hundreds of people around the city came to hearings, they made phone calls, they did letters, they had events all over the city for several years, and they were able to get the council to unanimously adopt comprehensive reform legislation to implement the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations. In 2005, facing intense public pressure, the district took steps to implement the Blue Ribbon Commission's recommendations. The result was the new Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, or DYRS, established to overhaul the juvenile justice system in the district. The top item on the agenda? The construction of a new secure facility for court-involved youth. Now, it's got to be at least 40 years that people have been talking about closing Oak Hill. What New Beginnings really does is it takes away the penal approach to uh, juvenile incarceration, and so it's really a much more therapeutic place. The key fact about New Beginnings as opposed to the old Oak Hill is that it's a small institution. New Beginnings demonstrates what can be done. It's a very successful program. Lots of light modern furniture, modern architecture, and it looks like a school, a place that kids feel that they're not just being warehoused. Another major difference is how the staff see their role. The staff see themselves as youth development specialists. Their role is to engage with the youth, to work with the youth, to help them learn how to problem solve, help them learn how to organize themselves to become productive adults. We have one of the most successful schools in juvenile corrections in the country. This school engages the young people. The, they have small classrooms. Every kid must go to school five days a week. The school system was taken over by the Sea Forever Foundation, which established the Maya Angelou Public Charter School in the district in 1998 to help youth in the juvenile justice system gain responsibility and learn the skills they needed to succeed. The average kid improves his reading and math scores by almost 1.5 years on an annualized basis, almost three times the rate they had been improving their skills over the course of their educational experience prior to that. Many kids say that it's the first time they've had a decent school in their experience up to this point. For many of the young men, when they first get into New Beginnings, oftentimes they're fighting against the system and they just feel like they're just going to have to do their time and they can get out. And what they slowly come to realize is that they actually have to engage in their own treatment. They have a level system, so you can't leave until you achieve level six. Who decides whether they get to the next level? Not just the staff, but all of the kids. They get feedback from the other young people, and that kind of approach actually helps young people to do problem solving, decision making, they learn to work in a group, they learn to be a member of a team. All of those kinds of skill sets will then help those young people when they leave the facility become productive adults. The energy around here is so positive. We have our monthly award ceremonies, they have incentives where they earn stars, and you would think there's a piece of paper, what power would it have? But everyone wants to be recognized. And when these kids are being recognized for positive things, they are reinforcing that. Samantha Simpour, a behavioral management specialist, runs the Academy's Welcome Center, a one-on-one -on -one orientation for all new students, or scholars as the Academy prefers to call them. There she evaluates the scholars' skills and educational experience and explains what is expected of them during their stay. The Welcome Center consists of allowing the scholars to be exposed to my story, because I'm an open book to them, because I need them to realize that 
there is a way for you to transition through your your storm right now. So I say, you know, once you're part of this family, you're always a part of the family. And we're going to check up on you. And we're going to make sure that you're on track. We're going to make sure that you are successful because we're preparing you with the tools to be just that. Now, when youth go into new beginnings, I actually feel that they come back as stronger individuals. They more understand the role that education can play in their lives. I've had some youth say that they never understood why they needed an education before they went to new beginnings. We have kids going off to college. Do you hear me? College. <laughs> Not DC, I'm talking about college. We have Maya Angelou scholars in college from New Beginnings. That's powerful. Here in this environment now and New Beginnings compared to the way Oak Hill was, huge transformation. Huge transformation. Like my first day coming inside of the place, I literally broke down and cried because I said, they're going to get it. They're going to get it. They're going to get what they need in the midst of the triumph. They're going to get it. And they're getting it. And they're getting it. They're getting it. They're getting the mental health. They're getting the counseling. You know, they're trying to reunify the families. My goal in life is to be a role model to my kid that's on the way. And that's it. I see Mike more than anything becoming a leader and stepping into a leadership role. Over the years at Mentoring Today, I've seen the tremendous growth that the juvenile justice system has made from the closing of Oak Hill Youth Center to the opening of New Beginnings. And I do really feel that we're starting a new chapter where our young people are seen as assets of our community and not just individuals who should be locked away. That being said, we still have a very long way to go. I'm optimistic on, on the one hand because I see what has been done, uh, but, but I'm uh, a little bit troubled on the other hand because, uh, you know, one, one or two bad cases sometimes uh, can, can, can have a tendency of threatening the existence of the whole system. I mean, you can't judge a whole system uh, by one or two unfortunate uh, incidents. Juvenile uh, offenses are down and I think that speaks for itself. The part that uh, has not been carried out is a seamless uh, transition back to the community with adequate, competent, community-based prevention and treatment resources. And uh, that's where we uh, lose um, a lot of the, the children today. We do have too, too many young men who do well at the Maya Angelou Academy who leave us and go back to a system that isn't ready to support them. So they go back to large, poorly performing high schools that aren't really ready to help them continue to make the gains they've started to make while they were at New Beginnings. In October of 2009, DYRS launched a citywide network of community-based service providers in order to provide committed youth with mentoring, community supervision, and job development, among other services. Progress has been made but there is more to do to make this service coalition seamless, robust, and fully effective. We need to all take a leadership role because if we ignore their problems, their problems will become a matter of ours. We need these community-based resources uh, to, to serve our children. Now, if we don't have those community-based services to serve children, things are out of adjustment. These young people who we work with are capable of so much. What we really see also in, in Mike is an ability to give back to their community. They can give back to the very same juvenile justice system that they came from. So I think that's what they're most capable of, is being positive role models and leaders in their own communities. This is a juvenile justice system. They, they don't, they're not going to be locked up for the rest of their lives. When they come back, we want them to be productive members of society. Education is key, just like it's key for you, for me, for everybody. It's, it's essential. And if they have the sense that they can achieve something with their brains and, and uh, by learning things, then that'll be good, good for society. And that's what we mean by youth building. And uh, uh, build youth uh, to be able to take care of themselves and take care of others and take care of the community. And, and it's not something that's done uh, overnight. Uh, it's something that uh, we, we have to work on continuously. You just need the will, some say the political will, and the determination to do it.